Good afternoon, and welcome to the Board of County Commissioners uh, 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 County Meeting, Tuesday, March 5, 2019. Uh, I'm uh, Chair of the Board, John Hutchings. To my left is Co-Chair, uh, Commissioner Gary Edwards. To my right, Commissioner Ty Menser. To his right, La Bonita Bomar, Clerk of the Board. To her right is uh, County Manager Romero Chavez. To his right is uh, the Assistant County Manager and Finance Director Robin Campbell. And to her right is Gracie O'Connor, I knew it, uh, uh, our deputy um, prosecuting attorney. So with that, uh, we'd like to please uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Menser. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn to uh, County Manager Romero Chavez for an amendment. Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioners. I would like to propose uh, an amendment to the agenda, and um, that is on the uh, presentation sections. It was a administrative oversight, but uh, certainly we have the Pleasure to have uh, Mr. Timothy Stokes, the president of South Puget Sound Community College. And uh, they would like to um, give you a, a presentation related to the brewing and distilling uh, craft district that is currently under development in Tumwater. Also, in association how the Puget Sound Community College is, um, is implementing a program related to uh, the uh, brewing and distilling um, industry. So I'd like to propose that as an as amendment for your consideration. Well, uh, did uh, doctor, did you bring any samples? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you. We're, we'll add that as a presentation. Uh, so I now look for uh, an approval of the March 5th, 2019 agenda. As amended. As amended. I would move to approve the agenda for the March 5th, 2019. If, nope. uh, as amended, Commissioner? Perhaps? As amended. <laughs> Thank you. It's an agenda. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 We have an agenda. Uh, looking to approve uh, the board meeting minutes. I would approve the board meeting minutes from February 19th, 2019. Second. It's been uh, moved and seconded to approve the meeting minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Now we're moving to the point of the agenda for presentations, and the first one's from the commissioner's office. Yeah, uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, sometimes um, all the effort the county employees go through on a daily basis uh, sometimes goes unnoticed. But I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to highlight um, the incredible response um, the um, county employees did during the um, snow events that we had just about two weeks ago. So we have um, the directors of uh, public works, um, the interim director of central services, and the uh, director of emergency services, along with uh, key staff who played uh, the incredible role. Um, before they come to the podium, let me give you um, by the numbers. In public works, uh, during a period of uh, those five days, we plowed uh, close to 12,000 lane miles of county roads. We used nine dump trucks that were outfitted with plows in the front. We also used four pickup trucks that were outfitted for plows. And we used, used also three graders to clear the snow. We applied uh, 25,000 gallons of brine and pre -treated, to pre-treat county roads. We spread 300 tons of sand on county roads we cleared 279 road blockages, including trees down and power lines down. And, and on that um, period of time, we answered close to 1,100 uh, customer calls uh, requesting for assistance. Um, and also, uh, we couldn't do anything without the uh, facilities and the support they provide to make sure that we clear the parking lots and as well as we provide uh, adequate access, not just to county employees, to facilities uh, owned by the county, 
but also um, to the citizens that come and do business here in the county. So from central services, facilities and staff work with close to 55 overtime hours, additional hours that is five days, including the weekend. Also, the fleet part, part of that department, um, uh, they uh, conducted 235 repairs to all the equipment that we were using to uh, do the snow response. And also the fleet um, uh, division, excuse me, um, it spends close to 68 hours prior to those events just to make sure all the preparation is in place and all the equipment is aligned um, for, uh, again, to respond from public works in the sheriff's office related to the equipment. But also we need, um, we need somebody who can oversee in case of emergencies. And, uh, and, and that's how an emergencies, emergency services division uh, department has conducted you know, the coordinating aspects of all this response, which they, <clears throat> which they coordinated with the Washington State EOC, that's the Emergency um, Operations Center. Operation Center. Center. And also, they, uh, you may don't know, but during that weekend, the, um, one of the state offices buildings was down with no power. It just happens that we used to hold our server where we conduct all the internet services. Wonderful. So uh, during that weekend, uh, emergency services will work diligently to restore um, uh, access to our internet, which is essential to our response. They also coordinated with the American Cross to open shelters. They coordinated with the search and rescue of volunteers um, just to provide a full wheel drive capabilities for uh, a medical, medical transports. Work with the auditor's office to assist on the ballot box collection during the special election. Although during that Tuesday, uh, we closed the, uh, the county offices, the duty of the auditor's office to conduct those elections, which emergency services supported the auditor's office. And lastly, but not least, work with Preachers on Energy uh, to work on restoring the outages across the county. So with that in mind, I will ask all the directors and all the staff to come forward and have the opportunity for the commissioners to give their thanks for the fantastic job that all, all of you did during the snow uh, storm responses. Ensuring that democracy does not stop. <laughs> Kurt, you didn't do this all by yourself, did you? Well, first of all, the emergency management staff is working diligently oh. back for the okay. next snow event, which we're supposed to get a little bit of snow tomorrow afternoon. So, so. most of us know you, but uh, for, for the record, how about introduce yourself? Oh, yes. Kurt Harden, uh, Director of Emergency Services. Jennifer Walker, Public Works Director. So I wasn't sure how you were going to move forward with this. So. Um, First of all, I guess thank you for acknowledging the work um, of Public Works. It was definitely a, a team approach. I think we did a lot of collaboration and pre-planning. Um, so to me, from my perspective, there were three items that uh, contributed to the success. It was the pre-planning, so making sure that we had the materials on hand, that the equipment was working, coordinating with um, uh, ERNR. It was the um, great partnering that happened. So not only did our crews go on 24-hour um, operations, to 12 hours on, 12 hours off. But so did emergency, or so did ER and R, um, and so they and they split their shifts. So that was quite helpful. Um, but we were on 12-hour uh, shifts for eight hour, or eight days. Um, we had, as you know, 20-some uh, inches of snow, um, and I think the last and most important component was our amazing staff. So we had about 100 people that worked. Um, it was from communication, administration. Um, our, we lost power at the Waste and Recovery Center. Um, and so we had people filling that or clearing snow. Um, we had our power go down <coughs> at all of our utilities. Um, and so we had to work on the backup generators. Um, but would, 
did not lose any service. Um, and I want to uh, acknowledge Lucy Mills. Lucy, will you stand up, please? Lucy is our uh, road operations division manager, and she started planning for this effort after last February um, and putting steps in place to ensure um, that we would be ready for responding. So Lucy, thank you. You did a fantastic job. And thank you to all. We've got quite a few of Public Works folks here representing, but we also have uh, quite a few that are still out working in the field. So I am extremely, extremely proud of them. They did a fantastic, fantastic job. Well, wait, before you leave, it seems like I should have some confetti or glitter or something, but I don't. <laughs> um, I just want before, before I know Kurt, you're going to maybe speak to it, but the public works crew, all you men and women, ensured democracy moved on because the ballot doesn't stop. The voting is still very precious and, uh, and sacred to us. So thank you. Yes. I, I do want to add, I had an opportunity to go out and ride in one of the snow plows in the evening. And um, it was quite the experience. It was also phenomenal to see the support of the citizens. So as we were going by, and this was in the middle, this was at midnight, um, and there were folks out and they were giving the thumbs up and they were waving <laughs> and saying thank you. So it was really nice to see. Can I do that, Romero? Can I take, get a ride along? Absolutely. Thank you. So are you requesting next, snow next, so you can next, get a ride along? Next is storm event. Tomorrow's not going to be an event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would like just to echo Kurt Harn again in emergency services, but I would like to echo Jennifer's uh, comments about the great work that the staff did. Uh, staff at Public Works, but staff at emergency management as well, the auditor's office, uh, central services, because this is a team effort. But also, we did a regional approach as well, um, the city of Olympia, city of Lacey, Tumwater, because roads don't, don't stop at the county border. There's city roads and city transportation that you have to clear, plus sheltering. It's, it's a regional effort. Um, I really want to say thanks to our volunteers, search and rescue. I will tell you, those folks stepped up with their four-wheel drive, and they're volunteers, and they volunteer their time, their gas, their, you know, their uh, efforts to help with the auditor's office as an example, and they're just willing to go, okay, we'll take you out where you need to go. And so mm -hmm. it's one of those situations where people stepped up all across the county, but I want to give a real big thought, shout out to the folks at emergency management because they, as with Public uh, Works, worked the weekend. Um, you had James Yates, you had uh, Sonia Crozy, you had Sandy Ecker, you had Vivian Eason, and they were all out there working, and, and honestly, we did something for the first time. We did a virtual ECC activation, which worked very well and allowed us to be able to be flexible and adaptable in our response to this situation. And that is actually the staff who came up with that concept, and it looks like it went very well. The last thing I'd like to say is tomorrow there is an AAR for Thurston County and our region here to look at the snow uh, event and look at how we can get better. We did, a, I think it was a fantastic job. We want to sustain the success. But at the same time, how can we make it better for our responses in the future? What, what is the acronym? What, you want to explain AAR? Oh, excuse me. Uh, after F action F review, we're all a, a victim of acronyms. After <laughs> action review is a process where we take a look at how we responded, take a look at what we want to sustain, and take a look at how we want to improve. And uh, Julie Deru, she's representing facilities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Julie Deru, facility services manager. I'd like to um, acknowledge my facility staff of 12 um, who worked without ceasing. Not only do they have the skill, but they have the motivation and the dedication to not give up and ensure that the buildings are in operation and available for citizens and employees access, as well as our vendor partners that we worked successfully with. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Julie, very much. Any questions or comments? Uh, no, I guess I'd just comment. They did see uh, snow plows out and such, the citizens, but there was a lot of behind the scenes activity and that's where Julie comes in on keeping things running that uh, made this all successful and thank you very much. Uh, Kurt, will you uh, explain how we supported our cities during that snow event? Sure. Um, what we did was we did coordination conference calls with the cities and also at the state level. And so what we were looking at is who had shelter uh, uh, capacity. As an, another example was there was a situation where uh, one of the cities was running a little short on snow removal uh, uh, supplies. And so Public Works was able to sell them uh, 4,000 gallons of brine that would help that kept that city moving and kept their road clearing operations moving along. 
Yeah, we're a capital county and support our capital city too. Correct. And other cities should they need it. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. For all the county employees to stand up, please. Yeah, please stand, county employees. Here we go. Thank you, one and all, very much for all you did. Thank you very much. Still recovering from the 12 on and 12 off shifts, or 12 on, 8 off, whatever it was. Uh, you do the math for several days. Thank you very much. So now we're moving on to, uh, again, commissioners, items of, of proclamation. <clears throat> yes, thank you, commissioners. Um, March is uh, National Women's uh, History Month. So let me give you uh, a little bit of history, and, and then I, I, I will make some introductions. Back in 1987, Congress declared March as National Women's History Month in perpetuity. Uh, yeah, the Special Romero. Presidential Proclamation. Romero, just one second, till we get the noise to subsides. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want this to get lost. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hit the door on your way out? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, from the top, in 1987, Congress declared March as National Women's History Month in perpetuity. A special presidential proclamation is issued every year, which honors the extraordinary achievements of American women. A little bit of uh, history behind all this, uh, some uh, points to be made uh, back in 1920. That was the first, the, the year in which women were granted the right to vote thanks to the 19th Amendment. In 1974, Thurston County elected the first uh, Thurston County uh, Commissioner uh, woman, uh, Margie Young, which she was instrumental in creating the county manager position, so thank you. <laughs> in 1981, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor was the first woman appointed to the United States Supreme Court. In 1983, Sally Ride became the first woman in space. And in 2016, Hillary Rodham Clinton was the first woman to be nominated as president by a major political party. And I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Thelma Jackson. She is a local activist, historian, and education advocate. She has served in the North Thurston School District for almost 20 years, and is president of, uh, it was president five times, as well as president of the Board of Trustees of the Evergreen State College, <clears throat> where she served for five, for six years, about, among numerous other community activities. Dr. Ja Jackson and her husband, Nat, have resided in Lacey in the Lacey area for 48 years. Dr. Jackson um, inspires others to reach their individual goals in greatest potential. Dr. Jackson, please join us. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, commissioners, Mr. Chavez. I'm honored to be invited here today to receive this resolution on behalf of National Women's Month. There are many women in Thurston County, so I'm honored that I've been asked to receive this honor on all of our behalf. It follows uh, the fact that February was Black History Month, so a lot of commemoration for blacks as a minority group, and now women as a significant part of the population. One such woman that I want to highlight today, and in the introductory remarks, a number of women were mentioned, and they are but a small representation of the outstanding women that have contributed to making Thurston County the terrific place to live that it is women of all races and ethnicities, women coming from all walks of life have been active participants. And thankfully for the uh, national commemoration, women get to be honored in this way. And the one particular woman that I want to highlight uh, follows right with the previous Black History Month, which is Rebecca Howard. 
a black uh, businesswoman in this area in the 1860s. And people don't often think of Thurston County and this Olympia, Tumwater, Lacey area of having had uh, very many black pioneers. We hear about George Bush. Mm -hmm. We hear about George Washington down in Centralia. But to think in terms of 1860s that a hotel and a restaurant existed in downtown Olympia that Rebecca and her husband Alexander operated. Uh, there is a mural painted on the side of the bread peddler today that commemorates uh, their presence in Olympia. And the diamond parking lot uh, right there next to the bread peddler is the actual location hmm. of where the Pacific Hotel existed. So there's a lot more history, black history, women's history in Thurston County that's uh, traditionally known. And as part of an ongoing activity of documenting, researching, and publishing uh, the presence of uh, black history in this area, Rebecca Howard would definitely be featured in uh, more publications coming up. But we are proud to say that an effort has resulted in a portion of East Bay Drive being named Howard's Point in honor of Rebecca and Alexander Howard as a result of some local historical diggings and found where they actually lived and where their farm was located. So sometimes towards the end of this year, it will be officially named. It has uh, been unanimously approved by the State Historical Naming Commission, and that recommendation will be moving forward to the National Historical Naming Con Com uh, Commission. So sometime before the end of this year, there will be an official naming ceremony and an official marker. So heading north on East Bay Drive before you come to that first cluster of homes on the left, that will be officially named Howard's Point in honor of Rebecca and Alexander Howard. And she is just one outstanding woman that represents what's being commemorated here today. But she's one that not very many people realize and know she was entrepreneurial. She contributed to the economic development of this area and will soon be able to publicly acknowledge her in this way. But on behalf of not only Rebecca and all the other women that were named um, and women of Thurston County, um, I appreciate the resolution that you pass here today in honor of National Women's Month. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> uh, comments or questions before you read? No, I'll, I'll be saying plenty when I have okay. to read. Yeah, okay. Thank we'll you. wait. <laughs> uh, Thurston County Proclamation, Women's History Month. Whereas women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made and continue to make historic contributions to the growth and strength of Thurston County, the state of Washington, our nation, and the global community, and whereas these contributions have been critical to the growth and development of our economy, our culture, and artistic achievements, our social advancement, and all areas of accomplishment, and whereas American women play a unique role throughout the history of the nation by providing the majority of the volunteer labor force of the nation, and whereas American women are particularly important in the establishment of early charitable, philanthropic, and cultural institutions in our nation, and whereas American women of every race, class, and ethnic background served as early leaders in the forefront of every major progressive social change movement, including the right to vote, improved employment rights, the civil rights movement, especially the peace movement, which creates a more just society for all, and whereas American women continue to have an increasing representation as public officials in all levels of government and serve our country courageously in the military 
And whereas Women's History Month derived from the International Women's Day commemorating working women in the early 20th century has been designated Women's History Month in our nation and each year since 1987, the President of the United States has proclaimed March to be the National Women's History Month. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Thurston County Commissioners hereby proclaim March 2019 to be Women's History Month in Thurston County and encourage all residents to participate in ceremonies and events to commemorate and honor women for their countless contributions to our community and nation and to learn more about the significant role women have had in the creation of our history. Adopted today's date, March 2019. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah. But, but where's Nat? Where's Nat? Yeah. Do you have any comments or questions? Ty? I don't think so. Before we come down to get a picture, I, I want to like to say a few words, and that is uh, you're also an icon. Uh, in this community, and I remember when I was with the Olympia Police Department back in the 80s, you would come out and uh, provide training to all the police officers, uh, and I still remember that. Remember that today. Uh, I must have done good. <laughs> you, you've done real, real good, ma'am. Yes, you have, Doctor. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, I think it's kind of cool. And I'll, I'm going to paraphrase or quote Maya my Angelou when she said, uh, "We, it's, it's important that we respectfully take time to recognize uh, and celebrate our heroes." and our sheroes. And I wanted to, to bring out all of our, um, exec, our executive aides and the women here, our staff, uh, and the employees of the county and the leaders, the female women leadership we have throughout the county because it's, it's really changed over the decades. It really has. Um, and uh, you're gonna talk about? Um, Later. Okay, never mind. There's foreshadowing device right there. Thank you. Um, and if it wasn't for a woman, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> and if it wasn't for another woman who hooked up to be my running mate in 75, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So very prominent roles in my life. Question, comments? No. Nope. All uh, right. I mean, this board was all women at one time as well, so it fluctuates back and That's forth. That's true. So we have a proclamation to present to you, Thelma. All the women, please come forward for a picture. Yes, all of you, all of you. You're a she, bro. Yes, all of you, please. Yeah, we will go get a picture out here. Okay. Wait for Gear Bear. What's, what's Nat doing today? <laughs> I thought he'd be with you here today. Jumping rope or something. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner yeah, Edwards don't that. bite, so might okay. as well somebody goes on go. the other side, too. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't. You're, you're in good hands. Hard. You're in good hands. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Thanks for all you've done. You know, my, my wife used you as a my wife used you as a role model. Really? And she's been on the school board now like 30 years. I know down you spent Yeah, yeah. down in Yale. Doctor, what a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> All righty, where are we here? Does, does Dr. Tim have some more to go on? Yep. This? Yeah, okay. Now, uh, I would like to bring up uh, Dr. Timothy Stokes. President of the SPFCC. Come on up, sir. And I know you've got something pretty cool to talk about, as Romero said. Yeah, commissioners, uh, <laughs> county manager Chavez, thanks for inviting us out this afternoon. I actually brought someone who knows a lot more, actually brought two people who know a lot more about the project. But this project started back in 2014, and I think we are breaking ground here soon. We've started some of the construction work of, re of the retaining wall over on Tumwater Drive, uh, the road that takes you down to the Valley Athletic Club. But I brought with me Director of Public Relations, Kelly Green, and I think probably the person who has the coolest job in Thurston County, the Director of Brewing and Distilling, Frank Adeo. And they're going to talk to you about our project out in Tumwater. So thanks for having us. You're welcome. <coughs> 
Where's the samples? <laughs> yeah. Kelly. Commissioners, Mr. Chavez, thank you so much for, for having me. And Tim, thank you for that introduction. Um, we did just, we came here today to talk a little bit about uh, the craft district, which if you've been driving through Tumwater at all recently, uh, you've seen a little bit, so we're gonna get into that. But I was hoping to start with just a, a brief history of our brewing program. Um, and you do, you have a folder in front of you that has a couple of sheets and one has a little bit, yes. There's also a special surprise in there for you, but. Um, but yeah, so in this past fall, fall of 2018, we uh, launched the first uh, Associate of Applied Science degree in brewing, distilling, and cider making. So uh, Frank helped us get that up off the ground. It is the first degree of its kind. Uh, we're the first school to offer degrees in all three specialties. So you can find <laughs> brewing degrees, you can find uh, some distilling degrees, though it's not common. So we are right now the only uh, college offering that degree in all three disciplines. Uh, we have 28 students in our first class, so they are more than halfway through their first year and they'll be looking to graduate in June of 2020. Uh, our program prepares students for all aspects of the industry, so it's not just about beer making. They'll be learning business fundamentals, law, the legal requirements that uh, surround this highly regulated industry, uh, business principles, and then of course the art and science of brewing, distilling, or cider making. The first year focuses on some of those uh, fundamentals with the second year letting them get a little more specialized um, if there's one or more of the disciplines that they feel uh, is where their interest is, it lies. Um, but one of the coolest things that I think uh, Frank did with the program is it's really designed for either working adults and out of area adults. So what I mean by that is a lot of the sort of core classwork is done through online or hybrid classes and then the students come to Olympia for three or four day intensive weekends where they do the hands-on lab classes, they do visits to, they went to a hops farm in Yakima, you went to Georgetown Brewing, uh, they've gone to uh, facilities that make equipment, so manufacturers down in Portland and, and some others in the area. So really coming, coming together as a group and getting to uh, get out into the industry and meet some of the folks that they're gonna be working with. Um, and what we saw from our first class of students is that, uh, that this model has worked. So we have students from as far away as Corvallis participating in this program. So several of them are local, but we have, uh, it has been really achievable for some folks who don't live in this area, which we know will be key to, to long-term sustainability for a program like this. Um, but probably the thing you're, you're more excited to hear about today is the craft district. So you also have this sheet <laughs> with you. Um, so Craft District LLC has uh, created this site in Tumwater that is going to really be a destination um, for anyone who is interested in uh, either the, the making of these products or the consumption of these products. So uh, the building that we're going to be part of there, and you'll see a, a highlight outlined in red, is that we will actually share a space with Heritage Distilling Company out of Gig Harbor. Uh, we will have shared production space, so our students will be working on uh, real world production equipment, uh, and then we'll have a couple of floors where we'll have about 10,000 square feet of classroom space, lab, sp lab space, some offices, things like that. Um, but also in the district is going to be uh, a brewer, a cider maker. There's a market building that's gonna have a, a number of different local retail, uh, food, service uh, establishments in it. Um, and brown ground has already been broken on that site, so they have uh, put up uh, what's quite an impressive retaining wall. If you ever drive down to the valley, you can't miss it. Um, and then pouring of the slabs will start pretty soon. So our building is the first one that is going to go up there. So construction will, will get underway pretty quick with that. And then we hope to have our students in there by January of 2020. Um, one of the most interesting things about the way this site has developed is this really came together. There's been a number of uh, both public and private partners in this project. So uh, the county, the port, uh, Experience Olympia and beyond, WSU, city of Tumwater. I'm gonna to leave out a whole bunch of people, but uh, basically there's a whole lot of people who have come together to say uh, the craft beverage industry is an industry that we wanna grow in the county. And so the role that we get to play in that is ensuring that the employee pipeline and the knowledge pipeline is there to really help that industry grow. But there's uh, agricultural partners, so all of the work happening around the South Sound uh, agriculture industry is very exciting. It's definitely gonna uh, factor into to the work that happens here. And uh, we're just really excited to see 
where it grows. So, Frank, is there anything you wanted to add to put you on the spot? This is pretty exhaustive. <laughs> okay, so, um, so kind of next things are obviously going to be construction of this site. Our students this quarter are starting to get into hands-on brewing. We have some equipment that, that we just purchased that will allow them to sort of brew some of their first small batches. Um, they're getting into, you know, the exciting worlds of grains and yeast biology. So, you know, yeast biology. That, that is exciting <laughs> if you're a brewer. Um, we're going to have applications open really soon for our second class. So eventually we'd like to have uh, 60 students in the program between the two years of it. And then obviously we're going to continue working with uh, our partners in the industry. Uh, a lot of our instructors, a lot of the team working on our curriculum are local people working in the industry. So people who run breweries, people um, you know, throughout the community who are, who are doing this are who are contributing to our program. So we'll continue working with them to find areas where the industry is experiencing knowledge gaps or where our students should be learning so that when they go out into the workforce, they have uh, the knowledge that folks are going to need to, to thrive. So I think I'll just open it up to questions if there are any. Questions, comment? I'm really glad you guys started this because I see here that Washington's number two in craft brewing and that's unacceptable. So <laughs> <Yeah>. California's <laughs> bigger. Especially if number one, I'm guessing, is Oregon. Is it, is it California or is it Oregon? Really? Yeah, All yeah right. so I think we have a square footage well, deficit. That's more yeah. unacceptable. <laughs> so thank you, this looks interesting. And the, um, the, the craft district sheet Mm -hmm. The at the bottom are those, those are like uh, artist projections of what the. Yeah. Uh, yes. Correct. Yeah. The bottom of this sheet are the architect's renderings of what kind of our part of that building will look like. So if you ever get a chance to see, I know they have renderings of kind of the whole site. Um, it's really fantastic. It's going to have um, a restaurant, uh, event space. It's going to have an outdoor amphitheater. Uh, so they really are building it to be a place where people come to not only learn and produce, but to taste and to experience and to uh, to be kind of a um, a draw for the community. Is this all a coordinated project that's like one builder will have an integrated? Yeah, it's one developer and a whole lot of folks who are excited to be part of it. So it's been uh, a very coordinated effort. You know, some of the, the, the public partners uh, and ourselves have been working on some version of this for a really long time. So when Craft District came in with, uh, with the ability and the resources to actually purchase the land and start going on the site, we all sort of gelled around that site. Um, but it's definitely kind of a, a community-wide effort. I had the same question about the artist rendering at the bottom, mm -hmm. but what gave it away for me was when I looked at the middle picture with all the cards parked there, they're silver, gray, or white, and they're all perfectly aligned in the, <laughs> with the lines. Yeah. So I knew it was a drawing or something. Yeah, those grain silos are going to be quite a, uh, a visual feature because you'll see them as you're driving up from the, from the road. Questions or comments? Are you working with WSU on the grain portion of this by any chance? And the only reason I ask is I know our extension agent is actively involved in that. I was afraid to say anything in front of Dr. Stokes because I didn't know if there was a competition <laughs> No, and I, I will there definitely let not, Frank but, answer that question. Okay. Uh, yeah, so to, to answer your question, uh, we are working very closely with the uh, Thurston County uh, uh, Cooperative Extension. Uh, they are in their uh, second year of barley selection trials of uh, malt barley varieties that grow particularly well in the area. Uh, we're also working with a number of the craft maltsters that are located here in Washington. And we are starting discussions to see if we might be able to uh, bring uh, uh, malting to Thurston County as well. And we do definitely intend to utilize ingredients that are grown locally so we could support our local farmers. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Kelly, you said that this we're the first, SPSEC is the first in the state? Uh, we're the first in the country to offer um, an, an AA degree in all three uh, disciplines. And is Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, but last I checked, there was no cider making degrees. That's been uh, a little bit more of a niche field. So we're I the mean, first degree of any kind in that. Even in our state alone, we beat Spokane and, uh, and Seattle and Evergreen? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's we're champion. We're quite an innovative school. That, what's that? We're quite an innovative school. Right. As long as the uh, BAC doesn't equal the GPA, <laughs> we're A-OK. -okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Doctor, thank you very much for bringing everybody in and putting this all together. And we do have some T-shirts for you. We want you to probably We'll see about that. The county manager might not let us have them. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs>
de, de, de ese salado. Oh, oh it is? <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. All right. Now we are to the point uh, where we're at the uh, public uh, comment section of the, uh, of the meeting. This is the chance for the public to address the Board of County Commissioners. Not to engage in debate, discussion, question and answer, uh, but just to listen. We stop talking and listen to you folks. Uh, and the board does not respond to public comment. And on a need basis, the county manager will follow up with specific items. Speakers are limited to three minutes each to address the board meeting. Attendees cannot donate their speaking time to another person. The board reserves the right to restrict a person's uh, opportunity to address the meeting for a good cause. Please silence your cell phones. No comments that are lewd or offensive to a reasonable person. We ask you to be respectful. No outbursts of any kind, applause or um, disapproval. No comments that are commercial in nature, such as a promotion for a for-profit business. No comments that are inflammatory, hateful, defamatory, or discriminatory. Uh, remarks about pending land use permits not allowed, or similar matters that could eventually come before the board on appeal. And all materials provided to the county may be considered public record, uh, subject to pu uh, public release upon request pursuant to the Public Records Act, Chapter 42.56 of the RCW. Thank you for cooperation. What I will do is call out the names um, of the people that have signed up to testify or come speak, and uh, I will then open it up, give everybody else a chance if they would like to. The first one uh, to be up is John Pettit, followed by, I believe, Terry. Didn't check yes or no. You want to? Okay, so John, followed by Terry Ballard. You know, three minutes is never enough for me. But John Pettit, I live on Rich Road down southeast Olympia. Uh, what I'm addressing today is actually the three different items. One is we're going to talk about a very minor detail. First of all, something referred to as a fee as opposed to a tax. The state Supreme Court has already identified fees are for specific uh, purposes to serve a specific person who pays the fee. A tax is for general revenue collection. A tax is, uh, so therefore, if you are charging a fee to somebody, that particular person is to receive the benefit of X number of dollars worth of benefit. Let's just use an example and say you had a $40 fee for septic out in the Henderson Inlet per year. Then the county, in this particular case, would generate a $40 worth of value back for that fee that's being collected. That's how fees work. Uh, currently, under the Henderson uh, uh, you know, on-site sewer system program, they collect $40 a, a year. And to my knowledge, the only thing that they actually do for the individual client that owns property there happens to be to send them a notice every three years that they need to get their septic tank rechecked. I'm thinking $120 to get a notice once every three years seems like a rather extreme amount. I think the county's been using this as a form of uh, general revenue so I'll look forward to perhaps the county manager in his efforts can uh, give a detailed expression of exactly what that $40 represents in expenditure. Now, on to the next part element. I only have a minute to do this one. Uh, back in September 12, 2017, the county decided that they would renew a ordinance in order to collect fees. The difficulty here is also on that same ordinance. It acknowledges basically that the ordinance had died uh, as effective December 31, 2016. But you renewed an ordinance and you charge people for a fee that wasn't uh, covered by ordinance. I think the county needs to refund these people about $250,000 for that group of people that paid. The ordinance number for your reference here is 15514, and you can take a look at it. 
And uh, I also had a particular on-site program which does detail the fact that the previous system had expired December 31, 2016. You can't make ordinances to charge fees for retroactive time frames. People are entitled to some money back unless you see something different, but three years is usually the time frame to get it corrected. I'll look forward to some information. All right, thank you. Uh, Terry Ballard followed by Scott Bannister. Good afternoon, my name is Terry Ballard. I'm a 35-year uh, veteran, Army, retired, and I have uh, two residences within uh, Thurston County, unincorporated. Um, I was just wondering if the uh, city manager had passed on this discrimination complaint to the uh, prosecuting attorney because that's the next level it should have gone, and then it goes to state level if they don't act on it. Uh, the next one, uh, the county manager um, uh, uh, responded to me in kind, which was not very good, okay, over a manipulation of uh, statistics that was used for the current uh, septic uh, fee. Um, and currently with, and I'm sure he was provided a copy by Mr. John Pettit, because he got a thank you from him. The Henderson Septic System Repairs. Hmm. Out of, uh, uh, out of three years, it had 28, uh, uh, 28 total uh, repairs, okay? And out of the three years, it would have, uh, it, out of the three years, it would have acquired a 0.018% failure rate. Wow, a little bit different from 14%, which was, the basis for the uh, septic fee. And then after you divide the 1931 into 28 of them, you have a, uh, a total failure rate of 0.0145%. A little different from 14%. Maybe they moved the dot the other way, I don't know. Um, for the three year total, it had a 0.014% uh, 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 failure rate, and then in three years, that was a 0.004%. Uh, the data was manipulated. Mr. Chavez over there said I was wrong to provide him the information. The information has been provided. Nothing has been done. Your public health, and th this stuff's neat. It just manipulates all the numbers that Mr. Story provided to Mr. Pettit. The next one is, this is the real kicker. After we were going through this ordinance for all, okay, Lacey produced a letter to me, and I don't live in Lacey, produced a letter to me that I was in 75 feet of the city sewer system. Keep in mind, once your on-site septic fails, you have to convert to the city sewer system per the Lacey City Ordinance. This is my address in unincorporated Thurston County. What are you going to do about it against the city of Lacey? This is wrong, okay? It was a manipulation from the numbers that was produced by the health department. I'm tired of this fight that I have to prove myself and I want something done because if you don't do anything, it goes to the next level and it go keeps on going up to the state and two of you know the group that I'm in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott Bannister, followed by Jerry. Jerry Drinker. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Scott Bannister from Yelm. Uh, not to beat up on Mr. Chavez, but you were appointed, I heard that today, in 1974. Your position was appointed in 1974. Was created, yes. Well, you're not an elected official. You don't answer to nothing that we ask. We address These the board. Thank you, sir. Individuals are elected officials. I've been up here and you told me that you're not going to look into the Second Amendment ordinance that we have. Our Second Amendment is going to be uh, looked into in this county, regardless of what you say. Council members, you're elected officials. You have an oath 
He does it. You need to start doing your job. Um, I don't mean to be rude, but we're the pe- we the people are asking you, demanding you to uphold your oaths. I have some paperwork here. I got it here a little bit late today. We are filing charges. I'm Ferguson, Bob Ferguson. And if you want to be a part of it, continue to screw with me, Mr. Chavez. Sir, you're addressing the board, okay? And not okay. staff, please. Thank you. Well, I, I've seen his track record by other individuals. You're the elected officials. I'm asking you. The people are demanding that you start doing something. I have this legal paperwork that we're serving, and I'll give you copies. I was planning on being here early. Situation didn't get there. I've asked for the second amendment. He, he, he's been breaking the law for, for, since he's been in office. We have the proof. This is all legal. We have sheriffs on board. I've been working with our sheriff, Sheriff Snaza, and his brother down in Lewis County. I understand his predicament where they're at, where he's John's at. But uh, that's, that's something different. We, our sheriffs need to stand up for this also. We have a sheriff over in Yakima County that is going to sign the warrant. But we need judges to sign these warrants and county commissioners to sign these warrants also. Because our sheriffs can sign the warrant. They have the power. Gary, you know that. You know the power of a sheriff. We the people are, are, are demanding that we start taking action to take our country in control of the way it's supposed to be instead of tyrannical criminals that are running it. All right. And he is acting as a tyrannical criminal. Thank you, sir. Do you have documents you want to provide to our deputy prosecuting attorney? Yes, I will. Thank you. Sure. Jerry. Hey, John, can I borrow you a minute? Or maybe borrow you too? Okay, who's that? Have a list of roles. Thank you. I'm going to grab this part right here. And I'll pull the side. And I'll grab this part. Sorry. Uh, my name's Jerry Durker. You have not been docked any time, Jerry. Oh, sorry. Thank you. My name's Jerry Durker. I live at 17, uh, pardon me, 2826 Cooper Point Road, Northwest, Olympia, Washington, 98502. Sorry, I almost gave you my old address. Uh, I'm an old man. Uh, and uh, this is an uh, aerial photo with some inset aerial photos. of the old uh, Sunberg Sand and Gravel Mine site that's now in the city and, and is uh, not going to be any sort of thing that you will be uh, voting upon any land use decisions or anything on uh, since then. Okay, uh, this site is sitting on top of uh, the highest hill in the, uh, in the area uh, and, uh, <coughs> pardon me, in that area of Cooper Point and uh, of Olympia. And uh, it has uh, a lot of uh, high pressure and extreme high pressure aquifers on it, extreme high, high sensitive areas uh, for aquifer areas and re aquifer recharge areas, as well as being inside of the uh, McAllister, uh, pardon me, Allison Springs and, uh, Green, uh, and uh, uh, Grass Lake areas of the, of, uh, for the wells for the city of Olympia, as well as uh, uh, has all of the water, pretty much all of the streams in the entire area north, south, south, east, and west, come from this site. Okay, this site has been uh, used illegally for uh, most of the time. It's been in operation since at least 1957, okay, for a lot of different things. It's been used legally to, for, as the log yard uh, for warehouser in the Port of Olympia for about 30 years while the uh, 
Cascade Pole uh, plant was there. I believe you said you were here in the 80s uh, as, a, uh, as a, a, a city, and you may have driven past there where the logs were piled up there. I know that probably Gary has, <laughs> and I have, and uh, <laughs> when I went to Evergreen back in the 70s and eight, early 80s. So uh, this, is, uh, this is something that's a real nasty place. The city of Olympia and the, the person who owns this thing is trying to change this from this industrial site to a housing development and cover up over all this hazardous waste. As you can see, there's piles, just this, these piles that are shown on this part here and back up in here. Uh, those were piles just done in 2015 and 2000, uh, 2014 and 2015. That was over 10 million pounds, 400 tr uh, double truckloads brought in there while the illegal operations were going on here. They have never, uh, since the county uh, denied uh, this pro uh, the gravel mine extension and shut down the old gravel mine because they had they had gone outside of their range back in 1978 and there was only a, a period of time between 71 and 78 that they had any permits and they didn't follow those from the county etc uh, that that has been operated illegally uh, to conceal the cascade pole site and other uh, uh, hazardous waste from all over the place plus they've been taking that stuff uh, in the last 14 years since it's been in the city they've been taking that stuff out and putting it underneath the port the city and a lot of developments around everywhere right now now the stormwater, they've just produced a stormwater uh, a report that says that they're dumping stormwater, contaminated stormwater that's untested off the site all the way down into the county, both at my house, um, right down there in the corner, at 28th and Cooper Point, and I have a spring and stuff like that and a large uh, pond and endangered species, and the headwaters for, but, uh, for the East Fork of the Butler Creek. Uh, they also dump it across. Uh, across Cooper Point into the, uh, yes, uh, into, into the Green Club Creek Basin. So uh, the Squaxin Islands are upset and everybody else is. So I just wanted to let you guys know that and thank you very much. I talked to uh, uh, Art Starry here this last week uh, and they are also, now, we finally got the <coughs> developer to allow us to go in and do testing. Which oh, thank you. The county can do it. thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That exhausts the people that have signed up. Is there anybody in the audience from the gallery that would like to address the uh, board? Going, going, gone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're moving on to the county manager's update. Thank you, um, commissioners. I have a couple updates for you. I apologize, I'm a little uh, under the weather today. And um, sometimes when we go across, we find um, surprises. And sometimes pleasantly surprised, um, pleasant surprises as we conduct business. Hey guys. I was, <clears throat> I was just made aware of uh, a publication uh, out of the governing magazine. And this is uh, the OpenGov is the one who wrote this article. And the title of this article, it states the three inspiring government performance management leaders to watch <coughs> in 2019. And uh, to my pleasant surprise, I was made aware, our own Robin Campbell, our assistant county manager, is featured in this article. So let me read to you what, briefly what this article about Robin is. Robin and her team has, uh, have modernized their performance management system and proposes to use technology software rather than an Excel to track performance, shift internal attitude from driving performance management to truly engaging in seeing its value. Leverage dashboard and performance conversations. Use a team approach to um, topic specific performance management. Create a set of measures for each office and department including financial and non-financial data. Uh, I believe that is just a testament of the great level of professionalism uh, the Robin brings to Thurston County and in, in the region as well as its citizens and also it is just great to know that she's been recognized at least at the at the national level. So, national, that's wonderful. Thank you Robin. Did you want to get up and say a few words Robin? No. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say that um, I was honored to find myself named in this magazine. 
but um, it takes a team. So I appreciate the work that everyone in Thurston County is doing to um, bring the county to a stage of performance management where we can demonstrate the great work that we all do here. And they didn't Thank tell you, you this in advance. No. <laughs> you just saw the article title, wanted to find, oh, who are they talking about? And you saw your name. Yeah, that, that's right. I, I was reading and I was wondering, oh, who, who can I call to uh, get some tips from? And, and one of those people was me, so. <laughs> That's yeah, great. call yourself. That's that's wonderful. That's a great uh, way to find it too. Any yeah. comments? Great team. Rob, do you know how they? I mean, you weren't interviewed, obviously, or you would have known. No, I, I work with. Um, I've been working with a company called OpenGov to bring the county uh, up to speed in these areas and to provide transparency to our citizens. I've done some um, national. Um, presentations on what we're doing this past year and I think that I was recognized from that great congratulations thank yeah, you just congratulations Robin thank you very much for thank all you, you do. when any of our staff are recognized locally regionally statewide or even nationally it just makes my chest well with pride I'm very happy congratulations thank you thank you and lastly let me um, to what um, has occurred uh, in the last two weeks, at least from the county commissioner's point of view. On Wednesday, uh, February the 20th, you receive a briefing related to uh, a communications plan related to uh, road improvements along Malin Road. On the same day at noon, you had a continuation of follow-up on the courthouse uh, project. And also, two in the afternoon, you receive a briefing on the habitat conservation plan. And I believe Commissioner Menser and Commissioner Hutchins, in that afternoon of Wednesday, February the 20th, in the evening, attended a short course in local planning, which is, uh, was held right here. Mm -hmm. The last week, um, we didn't have a, a, a Board of County Commissioners because Commissioner uh, Menser and Commissioner Hutchins, as well as uh, some county staff, including myself, attended almost, almost an entire week on the Integrated Emergency Management course. And uh, that was a, somewhat of an eye-opener. It was uh, concentrated in recovery strategies after uh, the 9.2 earthquake. And as you know, that is something, it's not about if, but it's a matter of when that is going to occur. At least from the administrative point of view, and I'm sure at the end of the meeting you will provide your own perspectives. It was extremely valuable to see all the Thurston County leaders come and concentrate on a focal um, uh, mission as to how we're gonna be working together to respond to this very surmountable uh, emergency that perhaps is really is upon us. As a result of those, uh, of those conversations, I think some of the steps we need, we need to take is uh, we uh, are going to be drafting a resolution for, for you to consider and uh, be part of this, uh, what I call the regional leaders team. And also, that will also lead to a uh, interlocal agreement, hopefully, by the end of this year, in which we'll define the roles and responsibilities as to how, how this regional uh, leaders group will operate under those emergency conditions. And also as a result of that, uh, Robin Campbell has already started engaging all the financial officers on the, on the cities and towns as to how they're gonna be uh, uh, managing the financial aspects to respond to this emergency. Um, that's all I have for you in terms of my report. All right. <clears throat> Questions of the county manager? No, sir, no. Okay. Takes us to uh, item three on the agenda, the consent calendar, uh, items A, B, and C. Is there a motion? Yes, I would move that we approve consent items A through C. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. Uh, department items, agenda number, uh, item number four, uh, IT a resolution for uh, regarding net mail email archive. Welcome, Brian. Hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. 
the afternoon. I'm Brian Ferris with the IT Technical Manager with the Information Technology Department, and I'm here today to ask for approval of resolution for a decommission plan for our oldest email archive system, which is called NetMail. Um, we have very old emails in this system from 2006, and we use it up through about 2016. 2017, we switched to a new system for archiving the emails, and we adopted a policy at that time that allows for staff to keep email records according to records retention requirements instead of just keeping everything. So this effort is a cleanup of the oldest archives that we no longer need to be kept. Uh, the plan that we're asking you to approve through the resolution outlines how we will achieve the cleaning up over a period of time over the next five years, and it's all detailed in there. We would get rid of the oldest emails each year and then go forward each year and get the uh, crank forward with that. The plan also allows for uh, IT, information technology, to work with each office and department to make sure that we retain any records that still may need to be kept, if there is any, according to retention requirements. Otherwise, we will delete the rest of the emails that are no longer needed. So thank you for your consideration on this. Okay. Questions? No. No, sir. All right. Thank you. Is there a motion? Thank you. I would move to approve the resolution to decommission the net mail email archive system for the years of 2006 through 2016 over the next five years as they come up for their proper date to be disposed of. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Item number five, PHSS. And we've got Carrie here to talk about a public hearing. <coughs> Hi everyone, I'm Carrie Hennon, part of Public Health and Social Services. I manage the treatment sales tax, which is a one-tenth of one percent sales tax collected countywide. We fund therapeutic courts and a range of mental health and substance use treatment and services. Um, I am here to ask you to set a public hearing to hear public testimony and consider changes to the county code related to the treatment sales tax. Uh, as you know, TST has an advisory committee, which is members of the community who are appointed by the board who make a non-binding recommendation to the board regarding the use of TST funds. They're also involved in performance management, performance reviews, et cetera. So the proposed ordinance would change a couple things related to the TST advisory committee. One, the current county code specifies that that committee will have seven members. The proposed change would change that to be no fewer than seven and no more than nine members. And there's also a little bit of language change to reflect the fact that the current language in the county code was written when the county was on an annual budget. So it specifies that the committee should make an annual budget recommendation now that the county is on a biennial budget. There's a proposed language change to change it to a regular budget recommendation to the board. So I thank you for your consideration. Questions? No. Questions? Uh, no, I, I okay. don't have any questions because we had a pretty good presentation this morning about this particular topic and got into the weeds on it, so I'm ready to go. The noxious weeds. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I would move to set a public hearing date for March 26th, 2019 at 3 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard in room 280 Building one of the Thurston County Courthouse to formally receive testimony and consider changes to the Thurston County Code 5.49.050 regarding the Treatment Sales Tax Advisory Committee. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Carrie. <laughs> Item number six. Uh, public Works, a hearing, again, another public hearing, and we have Teresa. Welcome, Teresa. Good afternoon. I'm Teresa Parsons with Thurston County Public Works. I'm here, actually, on behalf of the county engineer, Scott Lindblom. He um, has an opportunity to spend time with his family, so he asked me if I'd be here. And today, uh, I'm here to ask for the commission to set a public hearing regarding revisions to uh, Thurston County Code 13.56.310 uh, regarding vegetation clearing in uh, sensitive areas. Uh, 
The, currently, the code requires any person, including public works, to obtain approval from the Board of County Commissioners each time before trimming or removing trees within the rights of way designated as sensitive areas of interest. And they're listed in your code or your packet. I can go through them if you want. Uh, these requirements impair the ability of Thurston County Public Works to quickly respond to hazard trees and perform other tasks associated with vegetation trimming or removal that may be necessary to ensure the safety of the public within the Thurston County right-of-way. The proposed changes would also would exempt public works from, the requ from those requirements. In addition, the proposed changes would delegate the responsibility of approving removal or trimming of trees by others to the county manager. Uh, the proposed changes are in alignment with Initiative 8 of the county strategic plan. All right. Thank you. Questions? No. Again, we had uh, quite a discussion on this this morning at the work session. <clears throat> no questions. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Me either. I would move to set a public hearing for April 2nd, 2019 at 3 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard in room 280, building one of the Thurston County Courthouse to formally receive testimony and consider changes to Thurston County Code 13.56.310 sub A regarding landscaping and vegetation management. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. Thank you. And uh, item B, public hearing for Summit Lake Special Use District. Thank you, Teresa. And we have Tim, Tim Wilson here. Welcome, Timmy. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I'm Tim Wilson, Water Resources Manager with Public Works. And I am here to recommend that the board set a public hearing to consider formation of the Summit Lake Special Use District. As you'll recall, in 2018, the board received a valid petition from residents of Summit Lake asking that the Board of County Commissioners form a Summit Lake Special Use District. Per RCW 8538030, the board directed the county engineer to review the proposed boundary and assess the financial fee feasibility of the proposal. The county engineer determined the proposed uh, special use district's boundary is reasonable <coughs> and the proposed goals appear feasible. RCW 8538040 directs the county legislative authority to schedule a public hearing on the proposed SUD if the county's engineer, uh, engineer's report indicates the proposal is feasible. To satisfy the requirements of RCW 8538040, staff is respectfully recommending that the Board of County Commissioners set a public hearing for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019 at 5 p.m. to receive public testimony on their proposed Summit Lake Special Use District. Questions? Tim, if we um, move forward and set the hearing, by what, what is the means by which the public or the property owners get notified? of the time and place? The RCW states that um, it, it's a little bit different. We need to advertise twice in, um, in the, the paper of record, but it is not uh, a legal advertisement. It doesn't show up in the legal advertisement section. It uh, needs to be in a different uh, section of the paper. So uh, it'll be advertised twice, but a little differently than a typical public notice. There's no formal mailing. It's just through that advertisement process? Um, a formal mailing could be done at your request. And, and there's uh, on the, our county website, it'll be posted. That's correct. Okay. Any questions? Uh, earlier at our work session this morning, you talked about the, the voting process that led up to this. Correct. Uh, uh, you, made, you, you did say something I was confused about, that each parcel owner is going to get to vote, two, or gets two votes, and I'm trying to figure out how that is accomplished, especially when you have corporate entities and possibly estates that are jointly owned in some fashion or another. So 
what, what is the ballot process? How do they get a ballot? And how do they vote and then tabulate those votes? May I add something to that? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know the answer, or this is for the auditor. Or if you have four registered voters, which two don't vote? Like four people owning a property, for example. Yeah. Yeah, OK. <clears throat> Uh, so I did, did go back and review the RCWs um, regarding this. And um, so what I can tell you is that per uh, RCW 8538-105, the owner of land located in a special district who is a qualified voter of the special district, meaning if they're registered to vote, shall receive two votes at any election. Uh, and if land is owned as community property, each uh, spouse is entitled to one vote if both spouses otherwise qualify to vote unless one mm. spouse designates in writing that the other sp spouse may cast the vote. So it's basically two parcels, uh, two votes per parcel. And the RCWs do go on to say, uh, bear with me just one moment mm -hmm. here regarding commercial properties that um, if there is a registered voter associated with a, that property, there, there are two votes for that property. So Timberland um, uh, would receive two votes if there is a registered voter associated with that property. How do they get the ballot? How do these voters get the ballot that they're going to vote on? I, I can't speak to that at this point. That will be part of the auditor's um, uh, office because the department will not do that. Um, I can follow up with the auditor and okay. see what is the process the, that office will go through this particular voting. My concern is, and estate issues, you didn't address estate issues, but they could, maybe they're not even addressed in the RCW, I don't know. But there's enough variables in this that we're not really sure of is, and I just don't see why we need to be in a hurry, is uh, why I'm not so sure I want to vote in favor of moving this forward. I'm not against the process, but I am kind of against the timing involved here. And if there's no time restraint in place that we have to take action today, uh, I, I'm going to support not taking action today, and, and that's how I'm going to have to vote. Thank you very much. Sir. I, the concern that we've all, I think, shared to some degree is the input from citizens who are only part-time residents of Summit Lake. And we did take that into consideration because the original request was to set this hearing in February. And we kind of split the difference by making sure there was extra time. We, picked, we identified late March. It ends up being proposed for April 2nd. So that word could get out, so that you know, written comment could be taken in, so that um, the, the election itself would, would you know, be well after uh, a period where all the folks would be there. I have concern about using this um, process of, of if, if the concern is about folks who don't live here, how are they going to see something published in, is it the Olympian that it gets published? Or? I believe so, yes. So yeah. I don't really think that's helping. So if, if we have the power, and it may be a conversation for another day, but if we have the power to decide to send notice by mail, I would like that because then there would be absolute um, opportunity for the absentee owners to submit written comment, which I take just as seriously as somebody standing here at a, at a public hearing. And uh, in fact, they can get more than three minutes worth sometimes in if they send an email. So it can almost be better um, if there's a lot of history. And uh, the other thing I want to say, just for the record, is that if we were deciding on something definitively on April 2nd, then I would be hesitant in light of the the, the but this is simply, there will be an election if we allow that to go forward. This is public hearing regarding process. And no matter what is decided, it, 
the district cannot be created without a full election uh, with full participation of the residents. That's what makes me comfortable to go ahead and go forward. But I, but I would like to ask my seatmates if they would can contemplate um, doing a written mailing to the, to the citizens if we in fact voted to move forward on April 2nd. One point for consideration on that, and that would, that would be wonderful. Um, the only um, thing that I would bring to your attention is we are working off of their $5,000, by RCW, bond. we're working off of their $5,000 bond. So that could add a little bit of expense, but um, just to consider. May I ask the, uh, the yeah. seatmate, I want to ask you, Ty, uh, it's a great idea to do the mailing. However, if, they're, if they are absent for two, three, or six months out of the year, I would imagine they either stop mail or I don't know if they're forwarding it to wherever they live, King County or Arizona. So I don't know if, they would, if that would resolve it, but it makes probably make us feel better. If I owned property somewhere and I was worried about yeah. you know this type of situation yep. happening, I would make sure that someone was checking my mail or it was being forwarded. Now you know that may not be everybody, but I bet we will capture a significant proportion of those absentee folks who are responsible about their property ownership responsibilities. I've got more. You got more. But did you want to ch uh, jump in on this, Romero? Yeah, real quick? I, I, uh, this morning, uh, Commissioner Erwitz had, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, follow-up questions, and it was related to the makeup of the parcels, uh, lakefront versus upland. There is um, upland properties. There is 149 vacant properties, and 113 dwellings. On the lakefront, there is uh, 64 vacant properties in 367 dwellings. And I believe that was one of your questions this morning. Well, it was, but that, uh, I thought during the work session, I heard more, there was 400 and some watts. How many do you total, how many parcels are affected? I think, there, uh, I think the over 400 was the dwellings, but the properties, there's the vacant properties, parcels that need to be added to the total. That, that 690, right, Jim. 693 yeah. total Six, total oh, parcels, oh, okay. 480 of which are dwellings. Yeah, I and that's, that's what you heard, the 400 number it was the dwellings. Okay. I uh, just want to follow up with our conversation this morning. Yeah. That's an update. The, the other issue that I have <coughs> on this process is that individuals stand, should this thing pass, I, I don't know that it will, I'm not I'm just using a hypothetical here that a property owner that maybe has a residence there at the lake or a lot or one of these parcels that are being referred to and lives uh, say in Tacoma or King County and is registered in that jurisdiction, it sounds like that person is subject to being taxed should it pass without having a vote in the process because they're not a registered voter here in Thurston County. Can you clarify, am I right in that assumption? Or That's what it appears um, like to me in reading through the RCW that, that um, you have to be a registered owner um, within the area that is being considered. So I read that to read that you would need to be a registered owner in Thurston County. I, I guess that that makes Very it a bit more work. complicated for me, wondering if maybe a certain household or lot owner, especially a joint where there's a husband and wife, mm -hmm. uh, maybe somebody might want to get registered here in Thurston County. I don't know how how <clears throat> this issue is going to proceed in the end, but I'm just not myself. I'm just not comfortable in setting the hearing date. I realize we're not going to make a decision on that date. But I want to make sure everybody has adequate opportunity to be there and attend and be notified, whether it's through public notices that we may allow, maybe postings up there in the jurisdiction, uh, but somehow getting the word out to make sure everybody is involved that can be involved. And because of that, I just don't feel that the date of April 2nd is uh, beneficial to all the citizens. So, I would opt for another date, but I don't know if this is the form that we ought to uh, be considering that. I, the motion has set. I would ask my seatmate to read the motion because I'm going to vote against it. So we can, re uh, we can decide what we want. We can yeah. decide here? Well, as to whether we're going to do this or not, sure. Oh, well, no, but about the date. 
Well, we could pull it if we wanted to. Well, there is a but couple. But I'm not of, ready to do that. There is a couple of options that you have. Uh, you have uh, a motion before you that includes the April second, and I believe if you'd like to make a, a friendly amendment to the motion to have um, the the public hearing be later. I would recommend Commissioner Edwards for you to formally amend that motion that is considered at this point. Is that something that and then I you can and then you in? vote and on that motion whether you like to extend that? Um, oh, okay. To a date. Before we get to the the options of amending and such, I want I have more questions. Do you have questions? Go ahead. Um, hypothetically, should we have the hearing, the public hearing on the second of April? When would that go to the, the voters there at Summit Lake to vote? So no, I've worked on timing with the auditor's office, and again, this, this has to, per RCW, has to occur during one of the county's special election dates. Uh, so uh, we, were targeting, we were targeting the August uh, uh, special election, and in order to move forward with that, the resolution calling for the election from the Board of County Commissioners would need to uh, be delivered to the auditor's office no later than May 10th. Okay, for the resolution and such. Uh, In order I'm to get on the ballot time. for August. Okay, and so that still gives breathing room. And um, listening to uh, Commissioner Edwards about his concern, if someone's registered in King County, they can't vote down here for their special use district. But the reverse applies. They're registered here. They can't vote for any taxation, whatever, in King County that might impact them, right, logically. And this isn't the county or the government taxing Summit Lake for their water and, and, uh, and lake management. It's them wanting to do this themselves, tax themselves for that purpose, correct? Correct. Okay. I, I would just add, if I can add one more thing. So post um, the public hearing, which is appears to be required by RCW that at least the public hearing be held, there's a decision point by the commissioners. And um, so RC, RCW reads, after receiving the public testimony, the county legislative authority may cause an election to be held to authorize the creation of a special district if it finds Number one, that creation of the special district will be conducive to the public health, convenience, and welfare. Number two, that the creation of the special district will be of special benefit to a majority of the lands included within the special district. And number three, that the proposed improvements are feasible and economical, and that the benefits of these improvements exceed costs for the improvements. So at that point, if you're not uh, hearing that, you, you don't have to call an election. And as, as I said this morning, I, I concern myself with taxation uh, without representation, but in my opinion, that seems to be satisfied from this perspective that this is initiated by Summit Lake, not by the government, not by any government. They've petitioned to do this. They have met the statutory requirement of the number of signatures uh, to bring this forward by two and a half times what the law requires. And we've been discussing this for quite some time, and some people have emailed in, and some people have chimed in. Now we're setting, allegedly going to set it for a public hearing in, what, three or three and a half weeks' time. Still no decision, but still part of the process, right? Correct. Okay. Go ahead. I guess uh, you made a comment as you were explaining the process leading up to the election that I'd like to clarify, Tim. You made mention of a special election, and I don't know, did you mean primary election? I'm just trying to clarify that, and, and I'm not trying to trip you up or anything. Oh, no, no problem. I'm just reading right from the RCWs, and it, it uh, so under elections, 8538060, it says the county legislative authority or authorities shall designate a time and date for such election, which shall be one of the special election dates provided for in RCW 29A04330. So in speaking with the auditor's office on that, that, that is, there's only four or five dates that are preset for those elections each year. So oh, it's that's not, what I'm told by this. It's not a general election. It, it, is it, yeah. Well, is it a primary election, or could it be a general election? I guess 
that's my question. If it's if it's one of those dates, like I think they have school elections in February. I, I don't know. Cor that, correct. But. My understanding was this was the August primary, the date for the primary oh. election. Well, from, but could it be another date? That's what I'm looking for. Could it be in November? No. It, it said a pre. I understand it's a preset special elections. A, what kind of election? Preset. Preset. Well, preset. November is going a. to be a preset election. O four three thirty special. We're looking it up now. But you're oh. saying there's four or five special election dates? Yeah, I think. Uh, so I guess my question, piggybacking on your question, is if we if we if we delayed till May, that way we would miss the August deadline. What would be? Then when would it be voted on? If the public <laughs> hearing was in May, <laughs> then you said we wouldn't be. We'd miss the auditor's deadline for August. What's the next date? If my memory serves, it would be November, would be the next uh, election. And Robin's looking up that RCW. Oh, OK. And then maybe one other comment that maybe you could clarify. So is the general election. It sounds like there's 600 and some parcels. Correct. And we got petitioned by 25? I was incorrect. I went back and looked. We have 34 active. Petitions oh. registered. Oh, okay. So roughly five percent. So about five percent of the voters of that particular designated area Petitioned. have requested this. Or more and than three times the minimum that's required. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I am not against this concept. I am just kind of in a quandary here of uh, the represent the taxation without representation is one issue. And the the hurriedness of putting this on uh, for a ballot <coughs> issue, uh, I don't know how these ballots are going to get to these people, uh, where they live. I, I just, I'm, I'm confused a little bit, but I understand Robin has a little more information for us. So I'm looking at the RCW. Um, 29A04330, and it specifies that um, the special election shall be held on one of the following dates, um, the second Tuesday in February, the fourth Tuesday in April, the day of the primary election is specified in yet another RCW, or the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, which is the general election. Um, so, and the other RCW that names the date is the first um, Tuesday of August. So your, those are your choices, and there is the November election is named on that list, so. So okay. general election in November. Yeah, included, yeah, I think that your only options if you adopt something at this date would be either the August or the November if it was going to go this year. Okay, I, I, I guess for the sake of argument, uh, to give us a little more time and to give potential uh, participants in the public meeting a little more time and even staff a little more time to make sure we get everything all figured out. We don't move forward without having everything solid. <coughs> I'm going to make a friendly amendment. Uh, as part of procedure, um, you may not, you may want to read the, read the motion, oh. and then as part of the conversation, you introduce that amendment. I can read the motion in case it. Okay. Well, then we can have more discussion because I've got a question now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but go ahead. So I'll move. I'll, I'll move to set a public hearing for Tuesday, April second, two thousand nineteen, at five p.m or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard at the Thurston County Courthouse, Building 1, Room 280, to accept and consider public comments on the proposed formation of Summit Lake Special Use District as required by RCW 85.38.040. And I second that for the purpose of discussion, further discussion, before there's any amendment. And my, my question then is, if we go ahead with the public hearing on the 2nd of April, does that mean we have to have the vote in August? No. We can still push that down if we wanted to or needed to? You, you may find that you uh, may not call an election based uh -huh. on 
testimony that you receive at the at the public hearing, and um, I could find nothing in the RCWs stating that you had to have the election within a certain date. That was one that triggers stuff that we can't stop. The only Not that we hear public comment and decide to stop it. We can do that, yeah. But it sounds good. We're going to move that way, but want to give further time for residents. I didn't know if that started the clock with an ending date. So um, I believe the, the <clears throat> set in the public hearing for April 2nd is just allows to have the voting in the August election. But you're not bound to take an action Good. on those okay. terms. After the public hearing, whatever that you decide to, to hold, you have the option to stop the process. You didn't believe that it was in the best public interest. Or you can probably set a different date as to when the election should be. So all the options are um, available to you after the public hearing. So it, it's, it, everything is, is not tight to the August election, but the April 2nd allows for you to consider to put this on the August special election. That's really what it is. And how long have we been dealing with this issue now, to, to discussing it and uh, the, the patching it? The petitions were submitted in September. September of last of year. Of 2018. And so now we here are here we are March early um, yeah m oh, middle Mar early March rather of 2019. Then we're three weeks away from allegedly having a public hearing, and then five months after that before there's even a ballot. Correct. So a year. Basically. So I don't yeah. feel the least bit rushed anyway personally. So we have a motion. It's been seconded for this date. Is there an amendment? Then I I would make a. Uh, I have a question before I make the <laughs> amendment, and that is we've got a date of the 2nd of April in this motion. Do I need to make a friendly amendment of a date specific, yeah. or can I make it the week, the first week of uh, June, for an example? Or so the first, if, if, if first it's week the of May. If it, if it, so let me begin with the first week of May. That will be uh, Tuesday, May 7th. If it's the week, uh, first week in June, that will be uh, Tuesday, June 4th. And then a, yes. And then a ballot then. So you, you, you need to be specific as to what that amendment, that amendment is. So the 7th of May would give us another month, basically. Is that roughly somewhere in there? Is the 7th of May? One of the days that I could pick if I made a friendly yes, amendment. It's 7th of May is your Tuesday, which is your regular Board of County Commissioners, and, um, and the public hearing can be held. Is that uh, kind of the, usually the days you set this, for this drinks? For the most part. Okay. Uh, yeah. I would make a... Oh, wait, wait. But that, that would move the ballot date then? To November. To November. Or later. Or later. Okay. Okay, I'm just... I'm going to make a friendly amendment to the motion that the date be changed to May 7th instead of April 2nd, 2019. Everything else in the motion would be the same. Okay. So yeah, now we're waiting. Who is second the motion? Might not get a second. I seconded the motion. Okay, now you this. So this is the amendment. Yeah, so someone needs to second the motion to move it. Right. To amend it. To amend it. Yeah, I'm not willing to do that. <laughs> well, that's the process. Well, yeah. if no, nobody seconded it, then the amendment dies. But dies. I can second it. So that's what I ask uh, Commissioner Messer. Would you like to I'm second? Not second it? Nope. So okay. the amendment dies. So no, the motion before you is as, pre as presented. So the motion as presented, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Nay. And the motion carries. Two to one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy at its best. There wow. you go. Wow. <laughs> Aw, we're almost all done. He's a magic number. Huh? <laughs> uh, agenda item number seven, commissioners uh, and the county manager's items. The commissioner's report on stuff that we did last week, or the last two weeks, so we weren't here last week. Uh, and you want to go? Sure. So I'll just uh, report on a couple things. One is the emergency management that um, uh, county manager gave kind of an overview. We were there for, what, four days? Mm -hmm. And we 
had a structure in place that was developed by Thurston County staff uh, in connection with TRPC in order to give us an operating structure for the elected leaders to really just dig right in and feel what it was like. They kept us cold and hungry and uh, without any communication so that we would sort of understand uh, kind of the, com the a little bit of the conditions we might be under to make decisions. And if we are able to achieve, what I would like the public to know is that um, there was a cooperative environment that the uh, facilitators of the uh, training who work with groups all over the nation just seem to be astounded by the level of cooperation in Thurston County amongst elected officials. And if we actually achieve the interlocal agreement that's being worked on by our staff, I think that that would be unique in the nation. No, no jurisdiction will have gotten to the, to the state of advanced planning that we will be at. So I just hope that folks understand, uh, you know, that this is a really good work by our, our, um, our county staff and our, our regional leaders and TRPC, et cetera, to put us in a state because we know that this disaster is coming. So um, I really appreciated the uh, experience and I think the county was well served by having us uh, participate. Second thing I wanted to report on was last night I attended a uh, program down in Rochester at this, about the Scatter Creek Wildlife Area. There's six different units here and they're, they're starting a planning process. The public can, can uh, send emails to Derek Lowry at D-A-R-R-I-C dot L-O-W-E-R-Y at D-F-W dot W-A dot G-O-V if they have any input they want to make. They are actually preparing, uh, they're actually providing tours of the various units and I signed up for one in May. It's happening in like April, May, and June. You can get a, uh, a sign up on a, a small group to take a tour of one of the Scatter Creek Wildlife Area subunits. And that includes the Black River unit, which is right near Rochester, beautiful area. Uh, I took photos of that area um, uh, during, my, uh, during my campaign for commissioner. Davis Creek unit, the Glacial Heritage unit, which is only open during something called Prairie Appreciation Day, which I've never stated in, but I'm very excited to do that. They haven't said it for sure, but they usually have it be the first week, Saturday in May. And that's the only time that your public is allowed to go to this Glacial Heritage Unit. And a lot of school groups and other citizen groups will be there, and it's supposed to be really interesting. Um, so I just thought folks should know about that process in case they're uh, in they live around that region. This is Scatter Creek around Rochester, um, Little Rock. There's six units, as I say, but they're all in and around that, that part of the southern part of District 3. So that was super interesting. That's it for me. Coach well, I'll, I'll just keep it short. I just uh, want my fellow commissioners to know that when I attended this training that you folks went through this last week, I had hot water, so <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, it was a couple of years ago, but the, the, it sounds like the training was much more pleasant, but I didn't get that experience of roughing it, I guess. <laughs> Only decaf in the rooms with a coffee, <laughs> okay. with coffee uh, maker. Anyway, uh, just for my report activity, uh, water quality, uh, and the possibility of uh, contamination were the highlights of my week and uh, my concern about uh, biosolids being deposited along the uh, Nisqually River uh, uh, in follow-up with citizens that are also concerned. So that, that was my main activity. That's it. Uh. The short course on uh, local planning that uh, uh, Romero Chavez mentioned was very, very good. Um, we talked about the GMA, the UGA, the OPMA, and RCWs. <laughs> Learned a lot. And I'm not going to go through the acronyms. Uh, Commissioner uh, Menser and I attended the Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization agenda setting a governor board meeting. And as I recall, uh, Mason County Commissioner Kevin Schutte joined us by phone. Uh, and that was a good, robust, robust discussion on what's taking place, um, mental health-wise and uh, medical health-wise in the counties. A week, a week yeah, on the 22nd of February, on a Friday, I attended the Mason County 
uh, sheriff deputies award breakfast. Uh, a uh, police officer that I hired in Tenino back in 2013 uh, lateraled over to Mason County Sheriff's Office about two years ago, two, maybe two and a half years ago, and uh, uh, he was awarded, Steve Rowe was awarded Mason County Deputy of the Year. And I was very proud of him. He's got a great family. Uh, and uh, the guest speaker was Danny Frischman. And people that are just uh, nuts about Star Wars will know Danny Frischman, uh, or even the old sitcoms from the 70s. He was a, a bit actor on Night Court and all those comedic uh, roles, but he also played an Ewok in Star Wars, uh, which is his most popular uh, claim to fame. And uh, then I attended the Canvassing Board Special Election uh, Certification. Uh, attended the FEMA conference, which was an eye, it was a huge eye opener, and I've been dealing with emergency management for 30 some years, as you have. Uh, and, but it was an eye opener from a different perspective as a policy setter. So even this morning when I woke up and I was hearing the news about the devastation going on in Alabama um, with the tornadoes and such, I, I look at it from a completely different lens. How are we going to keep our citizens safe? When you're removed from response, removed from response to recovery, how do you protect your citizens ahead of time? How do you help them recover? How do you help feed them uh, and keep them safe and give them hope to stay, uh, uh, to stay and, and see it through? Because we'll do everything we can to help them out. Uh, it was very, very good, uh, a good training program. Uh, and then uh, this last Friday night, I attended a night on the town in Venice, put on by the Thurston County Chamber. A very uh, lovely event, about 350 people there. Uh, a lot of county, a lot of county folks attended, and it was very good. And then Saturday night, uh, I attended, and I saw this guy here, the vice chair, at the Scholars for Dollar, Dollars for Scholars auction in Yelm, raising kids, uh, raising money for kids uh, from Yelm to get college uh, scholarships. And I don't know how long that's been going on, how many years. About 25 years. I think last night, or last Saturday, we might have raised right around $100,000. $100,000, a ton of people, young and old there. And my wife even got a couple of things that we really didn't need. But someone will benefit from that. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was a lot of fun. And then this morning, this is my wrap, my wrap on this one. The North Thurston Education Foundation, I received an email from them a personal email from them that they are, uh, they talked about their 900 uh, homeless kids in North Thurston School District, our largest school district in the county. And I think they've got 14,000 enrollment, but 900 uh, homeless kids as of the last count. And they cited a story, or, yeah, they cited a story of this, this young man who's 19 who was homeless because his dad was in prison uh, for strangling mom and mom is, uh, is a, a, an addict, drug addict. So he had a challenge like, the only support he had was he would go to school during the daytime, work a part-time job after school, and then sleep behind a dumpster. And it breaks your heart. It shouldn't be that way to be a kid. It shouldn't hurt to be a kid. Uh, but now he's graduated, and he has a full-time job, and he's, he's thriving. So they are opening up the old, at the old Bally's uh, at uh, Martin, and, uh, Martin and Slater Kenny Fitness Center. They're opening up a resource center for kids, the homeless kids, from the school district. And they're partnering with the city of Lacey to do that. And it's kind of based on the Lacey Veterans Services Hub, uh, the way they reach out to kids and help them out. And it's heartwarming, and I'm going to put some effort into helping them out. I just have to do that. Great story. Anyway, that's it. I'm done. County Manager. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Commissioners. Uh, let me walk you through the, um, your combined upcoming schedule. Some of the appointments that I've been mentioning to you is where at least two commissioners will be present. You may have individual appointments on your individual calendars. Those will not be part of my report. Uh, this evening, you have an invitation to participate on the League of Women's uh, Voters, uh, which the subject is going to be um, water for the people and water for fish. Uh, and I believe um, uh, county staff is supporting the presentation as well. Wednesday, March 6th, that will be tomorrow, 9.30 you have an update uh, from Superior Court. At 10.30 you will have the opportunity to have a conversation with your PIOs, your public information officers, as to how the 2019-2020 strategic communications plan for the commissioner's office will be laid out. 
At 2 in the afternoon, you will have the opportunity to review the Masama Pocket Gopher interim uh, review process uh, that will be for 2019. And there's a yearly event until we can uh, we have a, a, a final HCP. At 4 in the afternoon, you also have an invitation to participate um, to a meet and greet. Uh, 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 to introduce the new executive director for the Port of Olympia. Thursday, March 7, uh, 9.30, you have a briefing related to the comprehensive plan and development code docketing process. At 10, you have a commissioner's check-in, and I will uh, be drafting the agenda related to that meeting. Thursday, March 7, at 5.30 in the afternoon, you have an invitation to participate in the South Puget Sound Salmon Enhancement Group and that will be located on the Lacey Community Center at 6729 Pacific Avenue in Lacey. Uh, Friday, March 8th, um, I believe Commissioner Hutchins and Commissioner Mincer will be participating on the Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization 2019 planning session. And nothing for Monday, March 11th, and then we'll come back here uh, Tuesday, March 12th, to do it all over again. Thank you. Um, at the uh, night in Venice, the Thurston Chamber, Thurston County Chamber event, I met the executive director of the Port of Olympia, Sam, and she is an engaging, down-to-earth, smart, funny lady. That was really cool. Uh, Commissioner Menser, did you engage in a pie contest <laughs> this last weekend? I, I'm trying to remember. I sure did. I was able to judge pies for the Senior Services uh, Pie Fest. Oh, tough and job. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was uh, I represented Thurston County. There was Mayor of Lacey, Yelm, Olympia, um, Tumwater, and uh, my group picked a very delicious blackberry pie to make it to the next round. <laughs> I, and then we started eating. The Mayor of Lacey and I realized we both had an affinity for rhubarb, so <laughs> We started trying to find every rhubarb pie, and we ended up, uh, I ended up eating so much that I declined an invitation to be one of the final, the judging of the finalists, because I didn't feel like I could do the pies justice. I was so full, so it was really wonderful. They had a great turnout. All good. All right. Anything else? Nope. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? I would move to adjourn the Board of County Commissioners meeting March 5th. 2019. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. Thank you. We're done. Okie doke. <clears throat>